All right. Um, first uh, PRC of the decade. Um, Happy New Year. This is the first colloquium of the year. And uh, I am extremely pleased that uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Gunter Dissertori, professor at ETH in Zurich, uh, who have been trying to do this colloquium for many years, and it was coming from Zurich to LA, when you have responsibilities in the physics coordination of a big experiment, CMS, and you're running a big group, and you're running a technology group, and you're running the particle, the Institute for Particle Physics and Astrophysics at ETH, it has been difficult, but we've man we finally managed to get him, to capture him, and he's here. And uh, uh, Gunter has been a professor at ETH for about 20 years now. Uh, he did his PhD at CERN in uh, high energy physics, uh, in quantum chromodynamics and uh, the alpha sub s, the coupling of the strong interactions. And uh, he, um, he was in one of the big, ex uh, uh, big experiments called Aleph at the ring where now the LHC is hosted, but before that it was an electron positron collider machine. Um, and he has been working in the same experiment that uh, we are also at Caltech. We have been collaborating for many years. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief of VPJC. He is a member of the Swiss, Austrian, and uh, American Physical Society. But I don't know, is there no Italian Physical Society? Gunther is Italian. And he's a fellow of the American Physical Society as well. Uh, he will talk to us today about, uh, what I, before we start, I wondered, yes, let's, let's uh, click on this so we come back from the image. But before we start, I wanted to say something that uh, Gunther has been working in the past years. Okay, so what's happening? It will come. So he has been working in the past years with the, with the Bank of Switzerland to design the 200 uh, franc Swiss uh, node which you see there, it is uh, a very meticulously and well designed with preservation of all the physics, uh, uh, including the directions of the particle tracks, including making a hybrid detector so that the two collaborations don't, <laughs> don't complain on which detector you put there. And you see the one, on the one side, it's one of these collisions. Uh, at the LHC with this hybrid imaginary detector so that nobody fights with anybody. And on the other side, he's got, uh, if we scroll a little bit down, what they designed is uh, from the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, the creation of space time, all the way to Earth and the coordinate, the, the right-handed coordinate system. And he has been giving this, you can find if you, if you, uh, if you type uh, his name on Google, you will see this fantastic public lecture where he talks about um, the design of the node. And if you take a magnifying glass and you look, Every single pixel in, in, in there, it is meant to be, to have the physics. And of course the node, he can show it to you afterwards, it has a lot of technology also. So it's the science and technology 200 Swiss franc node. When he did that and I saw that, of course I said, how many of this did the bank will give you to bring at CMS <laughs> for the upgrades? So with this, I want to thank Gunther uh, for, for being here. He's going to talk to us about technology transfer, the status of high energy physics and technology transfers, how we make instruments in high energy physics that then they become compact PET scanners and change the world of medical imaging. Thank you. <coughs> so dear Maria, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, invitation. It's a true honor giving this talk today. I'm not going to talk about uh, money. Indirectly, I will talk about money, but not about the banknotes in specific, specifically. What I would like to do, I would like to take you today on a, maybe a bit of an unusual journey that starts with uh, particle physics, in particular high energy collider physics, then continues via imaging of small animals and ends up with early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So probably a bit unusual combination. As you hopefully will see, the red line along this journey is uh, instrumentation. So let's start with the first part, which uh, where I attempt to give uh, a short uh, uh, report on the status of uh, particle physics, again in particular uh, collider high energy physics and the possible future. 
Now, if we talk about the status of uh, particle physics, obviously we have to talk about the framework within which uh, we operate and from which we somehow desperately try to escape or at least uh, push its boundaries, namely the standard model of particle physics. I don't have to explain the standard model of particle physics here. I only wanted to emphasize that it is really quite amazing. Once you fix very few but very powerful principles, space-time symmetries, gauge symmetries, there's not much left actually that you can write down as a Lagrangian. And that's why it can be written down in such a compact uh, manner as it's shown here. The first line of this Lagrangian shows the dynamics of gauge fields, the dynamics of spin one bosons. This is known since a long time, has been studied to great detail. The second line describes uh, the gauge interactions between fermion fields, also known since a long time, described to great detail. While the, sec the third and the fourth line are related to the latest newcomer, uh, a scalar field that has been introduced to describe uh, electroweak symmetry breaking and to give some kind of a dynamic description or generation of fermion masses, this is uh, much less studied and uh, needs to be scrutinized as much as possible as uh, I will discuss later on. Now the standard model is a renormalizable quantum field theory and the beauty of it of course is that it works. We know since a long time that it works and definitely we have seen that it works pretty well during the last 10 years of operation of the LHC. In fact, it's up to a few weeks, it's almost exactly 10 years that we started operations at the LHC that we had first collisions. And by now, after 10 years, the four big experiments uh, shown here, ATLAS, CMS, LHCV, ALICE, they have accumulated a lot of data, as I will, I will show. In fact, what is happening at the LHC? Uh, we are most of the time colliding protons. By now, we have done this at the very center of mass energies. Most of the statistics accumulated has been uh, accumulated at uh, the highest energy, 13 tera electron volt. Bunches of proton collide every 25 nanoseconds, uh, meaning that we have about 1 billion proton-proton collisions per second, and out of these we store about 1,000 per second. Now, in these proton-proton collisions, we generate, uh, what, what is generated are hundreds, or up to thousands of particles, charged and neutral ones. We analyze the properties of these events of these collisions. We measure particular properties like spectra of certain types of particles and we compare it to predictions of the standard model or extensions to it. Now these predictions of the standard model typically are expressed or calculated in, in, in a perturbative manner with the simple picture that in a proton-proton collision actually we have a collision of two partons, quarks or gluons, that end up in some final state. And there can be many final states. And the number of events of a particular final state is simply given by a first factor which is called the luminosity. This is a measure of kind of the intensity of the uh, beams delivered or let's say a measure of how many collisions actually the accelerator delivers times the probability for a particular process. So it's clear if you want to study a process with, which has a very small cross-section, so a very small probability, you need a lot of collisions to have a chance to get a statistically interesting number of events. And in fact, we got lots of uh, collisions by the accelerator so far. So what is shown here is this number, the so-called luminosity, as a function of years. So this is basically the number of collisions provided throughout the year. And the different curves are just different years. Starting from 2010, this is the green line. And it has to be blown up by a factor of 50 in order to be seen up to the latest year of data taking that we had in 2018. Now, I want to highlight a few points here. The first one is that the number of collisions provided by the accelerator in 2018 is more than a factor of 1,000 more than in our first year, where we were already very happy and excited about what we got. Now, factor 1,000 looks good, so increasing performance by such a big number. It looks even more impressive if you read it in a different manner. Assume that if the accelerator would have continued in the same performance as it was running in 2010, it was, would have taken us a thousand years to uh, collect the same data. The other uh, things I want to highlight is 
uh, to get the feeling what this means, this luminosity, which is a strange uh, number, it has a unit of inverse area, one can read it in the following way. It con corresponds to uh, more than 10 to the 16 proton-proton collisions that have occurred. And out of these, we have about 1 billion W bosons produced that decay to leptons. We have about 100 million top quark pairs produced. We have several thousand Higgs bosons produced that decay to photons. By now, we have about six times, seven times more statistics accumulated regarding uh, Higgs physics than we had at the discovery times. And out of these, all the four experiments together have produced more than 2,500 publications. Now, having a lots, of, lots of data means that you have access to a large dynamic range or you are able to do precision studies. And I want to give one example in the beginning that I personally like particularly. It's a very classical measurement at the Hadron Collider. Uh, one possibility in this process here is that you have a scattering of quarks and gluons and there is a simple transfers, um, transfer of momentum and the outgoing state is again quarks and gluons. And these quarks and gluons, if they get um, a large momentum kick, they move away from the interaction, they, trans they um, uh, convert into hadrons and these hadrons appear in the detector as sprays of, of particles and this we call jets. So one interesting measurement is simply what is the probability to measure a certain jet in a certain angular region with a certain momentum. We count this, we produce the spectrum. And this is what one gets. Now this is uh, such a spectrum. This is basically the probability of finding a jet with a certain transverse momentum in giga electron volts. And this is the cross-section, I'll read it as a probability. And let's focus just on the upper line here. The other lines are somehow the similar things just for other angular region. So the upper measurement here is the probability for finding a jet in the central part of the detector. The, the black dots are the data, and this is a double logarithmic plot, take note of that. And the yellow lines are prediction. This is a prediction from perturbative quantum chromodynamics, so from strong interactions. This is not a fit. This is not a parametric fit. And what one should notice is that the theory describes the data within 5 to 10 percent, cannot be seen directly here, over about 10 orders of magnitude. This one really should uh, uh, realize, 10 orders of magnitude. Uh, I might be wrong, but I'm not aware of another field of science where you have a measurement of a spectrum over 10 orders of magnitude and the theory that describes it over 10 orders of magnitude. The other thing to be noticed here is we, we find jets that uh, occur, uh, that have a transverse momentum of about 2 tera electron volt, meaning there are certain scattering events where the momentum exchanged here is about 2,000 GeV. Now, this corresponds to studying this scattering at the distance scale of 10 to the minus 19 meters. And again, as I'm not aware of another experiment that would probe nature at distance scales smaller than this one in a direct manner. Direct manner because this is the ultimate Rutherford scattering as we have it today. Of course, this is not the only process that can occur. There are hundreds, you know, hundreds of other types of processes. And one way of summarizing this is uh, often shown in these plots where on the x-axis you, you, you find the different types of things that can happen in this process. So production of jets, as we have just seen, production of WZ bosons, production of top quarks, production of Higgs bosons, productions of combinations of all these particles. And again, we see the cross-section here, the probability, the symbols are the data, and these gray lines are the predictions. And we see, first of all, that we have been able to measure processes that they have differ in, in probability by 15 orders of magnitude, 15 orders of magnitude. And the standard model predictions basically, in more or less all the cases, agree with the measurement. Now, people used to call this the stairway to heaven. I prefer to call it the stairway to hell uh, for two reasons. The first one is, of course, we would have liked going to raw process to see deviations of the data from the standard model prediction. The second is, once you go to very, there are some measurements that are really, really very difficult. It's really hard to, to get this uh, data out of this sample. Now, talking about Higgs physics in these last six to seven years, we have gone from the discovery, meaning having a handful of Higgs bosons decaying, for example, to leptons and photons, to today entering what one could call the early stages of precision studies of physics. Now what precision means, 
I will elaborate a little bit more soon. Basically, what we have measured by now is uh, how the Higgs boson couples to vector bosons, how it couples to third generation fermions, meaning top quarks, bottom quarks, tau leptons. What we see is, again, what the a Higgs a mechanism predicts, namely that the coupling, which is shown here, of a particle to the Higgs boson is proportional to the mass of the particle. Heavy particles couple more strongly than the Higgs boson. Now, in summary, what, where are we now? Where are we today? So regarding the Higgs boson, the precision which we have achieved in, in these measurements of these couplings, for example, the vector boson, is about 15%. 15%. And we have started to observe these couplings of uh, the Higgs to third-generation fermions. The next frontiers will be to test is this true also for other generation fermions, and the real next frontier will be to study the coupling of the Higgs boson to itself. Because this means studying this term in the standard model Lagrangian that we really have, uh, which, is, which we understand less or the least so far. It also means basically studying the potential of, uh, of the Higgs field and really studying the vacuum of nature. One way of studying this is by lo looking for production of two Higgs bosons, not only one. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of searches for new physics, for new particles, heavy particles. None have been found, so either they don't exist at all or they are heavier than a few TeV, few tera electron volt, roughly speaking, summarizing really in, in one sentence the work of, of, of uh, many, many, many people. There are measurements of very rare processes that have been achieved by now, really super rare processes, in particular looking at decays of some heavy uh, mesons, uh, which are interesting. And in some cases of these decays, at the moment one sees some anomalies, some deviation from the standard model, but it's a bit too early to make too strong conclusions. So, one could say it's a really a highly successful theory, but, and there's a big but, there are a number of open questions. The first one is, the Higgs boson is a scalar, so it is very sensitive to quantum loop effects. So basically, quantum loop effects can alter uh, properties of this scalar field in a very strong manner. So the question is, why is it actually so light? Why is it does not feel it, why isn't it feeling these strong quantum loop effects? Is it because there are other quantum loop effects related to new particles that we haven't seen so far directly that maybe protect, the, for example, the Higgs mass from growing? Is it that the Higgs maybe is not a fundamental particle, a composite particle? So it's some form factor effect that uh, prevents it from basically growing, for example, in mass. So this is an open question. Another big question is, in this uh, spectrum of particles, there is no good candidate for dark matter. So this is definitely a big problem. For me personally, one of the most serious things, and maybe the most interesting things, is that we really do not understand the underlying principle of flavor, meaning why do the masses of the fermions that we know span about 12 orders of magnitude? And why do they have these masses as they have? Okay? And why do they mix in certain patterns, like the charged leptons or the neutral leptons? Or the why do they mix in these patterns? And the answer might be related, again, to the Higgs boson, because after all, the interaction of the Higgs boson with fermion fields, which, by the way, is a new type of force, because it's not the gauge interaction, it's a new type of force. This uh, is encoding, basically, via the couplings, the, the, all these parameters here and the mixing. So maybe the answer is, is hidden somewhere there. Other questions are related to this also. Why are the neutrinos so light? Why, what is the real origin of matter antimatter symmetry? So it is clear that New physics is needed, but where is it? Or where is the scale of the new physics? So one way of expressing it is, one can say the standard model Lagrangian is just an effective Lagrangian. There must be other terms to be added which involve uh, new matter fields, new, interaction, uh, new interactions uh, that appear with some, with some parameter, which is typically a coupling, divided by some physics scale, by the relevant physics scale. For example, the mass of the of the new interacting boson, for example. And the, the classical example is Fermi's uh, uh, theory of weak interactions. The decay of a muon to three leptons can be described as basically a, a product of four fermion fields time, times a coefficient. At low energies, this looks like a point-like interaction. But if one goes to higher energy, one realizes this, that it involves a fundamental coupling 
and the scale, which is actually the mass of the W boson. And so the same thing is supposed to happen also at higher energies. We don't know what these new fields could be and we don't know what the scale is. And this is the big question. Today, nobody in the world can tell us clearly what is the scale of new physics. Is it a blank scale? Is it not far from a little weak scale? Is it somewhere in here? Nobody knows. Really. In the past, via precision measurements, even at lower energies, one could get a hint of the next scale. We had a hint of the electroweak scale. We had a hint of the Higgs mass or the top quark mass from lower energy measurements. So we knew somehow where to look at. Now, we don't get a similar hint for now. So the question is, maybe a combination of both precision and higher energy to detect any these things directly might be the successful thing again. But the question mark is really out there. Where is it exactly the scale? Maybe the Higgs boson is a gateway to it. One thing is clear. We are in an exploratory phase, a real exploratory phase. So you can ask, how do you explore the unknown? There are basically two directions. Either you increase the precision of your measurements, meaning you get more and more sensitive to small effects. Small effects can be induced by, again, quantum loops. And if, new, again, new particles appear in quantum loops, uh, they might alter the predictions. So having more, getting more statistics gives access to such effects. The other way to go is just increase the energy because then you can maybe directly produce new particles and probe them in this direct way. The LHC has been an important step from the previous accelerator in both directions, in energy and precision. The upgrade in intensity of the LHC, I will mention it later, will be a huge step in uh, statistics in precision. And whatever future machine or machines uh, there might be, if any, they should, be, they should also give us a huge step both in energy and in precision because we have to make sure that we cover really a large phase space. So which type of machine should it be? At the moment, there is a, a big discussion going on in the context of the update of the European strategy for particle physics. This is a community process, a bottom-up process in, in Europe. It has started two years ago with uh, inputs from the community, from the countries, big town hall meetings, uh, continued discussions, heated discussions. Now, in two weeks from now, a little group will start to draft a first a formulation of the strategy for the next five to six years. And if finally everybody ag agrees, it is uh, supposed to be approved by the Council of CERN in, uh, in uh, a few months from now. So as I said, the discussions are very heated. There are many options on the table. One, there's one thing where there is consensus. There's consensus that one needs a, a, a new electron-positron collider to study the Higgs boson in great detail. In a Higgs, in electron positron collider, one could produce hundreds or thousands or millions of Higgs bosons in a very clean environment, which would then allow to, for example, study the Higgs boson not to percent precision, but to sub, or let's say 10%, but to sub percent precision, okay? And there are many options on the table. So if you go to Amazon and type in, I want to buy an E plus E minus Higgs factory, you get, as usual in Amazon, a lot of options with price tags, with delivery times, uh, with op additional upgrades, and so on. So there are, for example, there's linear options, one a linear collider option proposed at CERN, one in, in Japan, and there are two circular collider options, one called the Future Circular Collider E plus E minus at CERN, and uh, a Chinese proposal that looks very similar to this one. The initial price tag is about five to 10 billion Swiss francs for an initial energy which would allow to do these Higgs studies. And then there are proposed upgrades. For example, the linear colliders could go up to one or three TeV. Or for the circular machines, the idea is rather to replace them later by ultimate energy proton-proton colliders, like 100 TeV proton-proton colliders. And you see how much you have to uh, pay in addition to, to, to get these upgrades. Is this a German billion or an American billion? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's one to one, basically. I mean, the Swiss franc to, to the, the US dollar today is one to one. Ah, you mean in, in this, is, this, is the, this is the basically an investment cost, material cost. So for, for the American accounting, do a factor of two or three, what is it? This is the European accounting. Ah, in that sense, uh, 10 to the nine. 10 to the nine. 
Uh, 10 to the 12, I would not be showing it. <laughs> 10 to the 9, sorry. And uh, again, this is in European accounting, it's basically materials cost. It's not including manpower. Not <laughs> yes. So, in fact, there are the, these scenarios, they are, they are much more detailed. Uh, don't look at the details here. I mean, it, it's very heavy, but there is a, this proposal of a linear collider in Japan. There's a proposal of a circular collider in, in China. And there are, there's quite a, a whole slew of proposals for options at CERN. And where the most kind of uh, a comprehensive program is uh, such a new collider infrastructure which would start from a 100 kilometer tunnel into which we could, you could put several types of colliders, a plus and minus, and uh, later on a proton-proton collider. And uh, of course, whatever is realized, if any, the challenges are huge. I mean, there are not only technical challenges, but those probably are less frightening to me, at least. There are huge societal, political, financial, environmental, energy consumption challenges to be solved. By now, there are geopolitical challenges, if you look at the countries that are involved. So quite daunting, but one should think about it, because if you don't think about it now, it will never happen. People are scared a bit by the time scales because these projects, if realized in its full glory, they would basically cover the entire century. You know? Now, many people get scared by this, and they think of their death, and they won't see it, and so on. <laughs> However, the head time scales are as such, and this is nothing new. If you think the first ideas and discussions about the, the Large Hadron Collider happened in the early 80s. Now we have the LHC running. The upgrade in intensity of the LHC is supposed to run until the end of uh, mid-30s. So if you look at this, this is 55 years. So if you add from today, from 2020, 55 years, we are in 75. So it's not something completely outrageous now that is proposed. It's not completely new. Now, while there are these discussions, there is one project that is approved. This is in what I mentioned before. It is the upgrade in intensity of the Large Hadron Collider. This upgrade will actually happen, especially of the experiments, in the mid-20s, which then will give another 10 years of running, and which should provide basically more than a factor of 10 in data to increase, as, as you remember, the precision. So this would then allow to, to study Higgs properties at a few percent and to get the first access probably to the Higgs self-coupling. Of course, it implies quite some experimental challenges. Uh, radiation, so part of the experiments have to be replaced to cope with the radiation. Pile-up, which I will discuss in a minute. Data rates will be huge, computing, there are huge problems. So there are quite a, a number of challenges to be solved in the next years. I want to give one example, pile-up. Pile-up is the following. Whenever you have a crossing of two bunches of protons in the LHC, you not, have, you not only have one proton-proton collisions, but you have several proton-proton collisions. At the moment, we can have 20 to 50 proton-proton collisions at the same time. In the future, we could have up to 200 proton-proton collisions giving about 200 so-called vertices. This is where the proton-proton collision has happened. Distributed over about five centimeters. This is basically the overlap of the Tipeen profile. Or you could say it in the following way, distributed over about 200 picoseconds. Now, out of these 200 proton-proton collision, there is one interesting one that you trigger on, which produces, for example, high momentum particles. This is what you want to study. What are all the other 199? All the others are the most likely thing to happen. And what is the most likely thing to happen? It's basically the soft breakup of protons in, a, in an inelastic proton-proton collision, producing five to 10 charged particles, not very uh, rich in momentum, but they appear there and they make the entire event very messy. So how to clean it up? How to separate these vertices? One proposal, this is now being followed up, and it actually was where co colleagues here at Caltech that were the early pioneers in proposing to use timing information much more uh, effectively. Why timing? This picture here can also be shown in the following way. We can show this, the, all these vertices of proton-proton collisions on the x-axis in, in space and on the y-axis in time. So these are plus minus 200 picoseconds, as I said. So if you project them only on the, on the spatial axis, 
you see that they start to cluster a lot because you lose the studying information, they cluster. And if they cluster too heavily, you cannot separate them. However, if we have timing information, so if you, may, if you are able to measure very precisely the time of the particles and the time difference from creation to appearance in a certain detector, basically we would be able to bin the timing axis and to look at the whole thing in several bins that are maybe 30 to 50 picoseconds wide in, in, uh, in time. And within a single bin, you don't have 200 vertices, you are left with 30 or 50 vertices that are, that are distributed again. And 30 to 50 vertices we know how to handle today already. So basically out of one event, we make again five or six events. Okay, that's the idea. But we need a certain layer in the detector that is able to deliver this information. And this is, has been proposed and is now being worked on to be installed in five to six years from now. And the idea of the one of the proposals, for example, in the central part of CMS detector is to install a thin layer of uh, scintillating crystal bars read out by silicon photomultipliers. And this detector is supposed to provide timing information at a level of 30 to 50 picoseconds, exactly what we need to do this bidding. Now, since I talk about LISO crystals, so the scintillating crystals, and about silicon photomultipliers, I want to go to the second part of the talk. So let's leave the main road, particle physics, and take an exit towards biomedical applications, motivated by what we just saw. So I want to talk about the development of positron emission tomography scanners. Why suddenly this change? Again, if you look at, for example, the CMS detector, um, and for example, uh, an event like this where you have two high energetic photons that, for example, were used to dis discover the Higgs boson. One important detector was a huge uh, electromagnetic colorimeter made out of scintillating crystals, read out with uh, photon sensors. Caltech and ETH Zurich were the leading institutions there, also involved in the construction and operation of this detector. Or as I just said, in the future it will be again scintillating bars to do timing and so on. And if you take this, just scale it down, it gave us a lot of expertise on scintillating crystals, on photosensors, on electronics, on data analysis. And exactly, it is exactly all what you need, for example, to develop positron emission tomography scanners. These scanners are like an electromagnetic calorimeter. These are rings of crystals that are read out by photosensors and they have to measure photons. Not 50 GeV photons, not 50 giga electron volt photons, but 511 keV photons. But the principle is the same. So just brief reminder of positron emission tomography as a biomedical imaging technology or technique, nuclear medical imaging technique. The idea is the following. You inject into, for preclinical studies into an animal or for clinical studies into a human, you inject a tracer, which is basically some molecule. It depends on what you want to study in biological terms. For example, if you inject basically sugar, sugar, for example, will enrich in regions where there's a lot of um, metabolism going on. For example, where cancer cells are uh, sitting, okay? Now, the molecule alone is not enough. You attach to the molecule uh, a uh, radioactive element that is a beta plus, undergoes a beta plus decay. Meaning, wherever this molecule is, there will be decays which produce positrons inside the tissue. These positrons, they can travel not far, up to a millimeter or so, typically less, until they meet an electron in the surrounding tissue. And then you have an annihilation of the electron positron into two photons. And since basically this annihilation occurs at rest, the two photons are back to back and carry exactly an energy which corresponds to the mass of the electron. So you have to measure two photons that are back to back and that they happen at the same time. So you put again, as I said before, a ring of crystals around it, try to capture all these uh, coincidence events. And then basically you try to reconstruct from what you measure uh, a, a spatial image. You want to reconstruct the distribution, the spatial distribution inside the body of tracer accumulation, right? This is an inverse problem. Basically you measure projections here and you go get back to the spatial distribution. Now, let's have a look in some more details of, of the technology, of, of the instrumentation aspects here. So what you have to measure is, uh, first of all, the appearance of photons, that there was a photon 
that the photon had 511 kV, so you have to measure the energy. You want to measure where it appeared, so you want to measure the spatial coordinates, and you measure the time. These are, these are the five variables. The time is needed because you want to check if, if you have two photons, if they are close in time, so that there's a coincidence. And the difference in time should be as small as possible. So you would like to have a precise time measurement so that you can make your window, which is a requirement of uh, being simultaneous, as small as possible. The smaller the window, the more you reduce noise from other random photons and so on. And the spatial information you get basically from the crystal that is hit. Now, from the crystal that is hit, you get two dimensions already. Typically, we cannot measure where exactly in the crystal the photon has interacted, which means that we know, for example, in this case, that the annihilation has occurred somewhere along this line, but there is some uncertainty. It gets worse if you go to larger angles. You see, this crystal has been hit, this crystal has been hit, but we know, don't know exactly where. So we know it has happened somewhere in this region, which means this influences the precision with which we can reconstruct the spatial distribution. This is called the parallax error. And now you see that there are some, a number of contradicting requirements. For example, on the one hand side, you would like to make the crystals very long. Why? Because then you are sure that you basically capture all the photons that appear. So you, you get high sensitivity of your detector. On the other hand, you would like to make them short in order to reduce the parallax error. So you have to find the compromise. Another contradicting requirement is the following. If you read out each crystal individually, and if you have small crystals, basically the spatial resolution is very much dominated by the size of the crystal. And this is good if you, if you, get, if you have small crystals, we can absorb large rates. So if here the rates of decay is very large, we want to have many channels in order to avoid that you have two uh, annihilation into the same channel, okay, pile up. So we, have, we are back to the problem of pile up as before, just that in a different environment. Now, on the other hand, if you want to increase the spatial resolution, one trick is to actually make bigger crystals and to distribute the light to many photosensors and to calculate some uh, center of gravity. This is one way of improving the, the precision. But if you have big crystal blocks and you have a high rate application, you have pile up. And uh, again, if you have big crystal blocks, it's good because you have less channels, less electronics and so on, but again, you have pile up. So a number of contradicting requirements and depending on what you want to do, you have to make a choice. And this brings me to a concrete implementation or construction of a scanner that we did in the last seven, eight years. It's called SAFIR. It's a small animal fast insert for MRI. I will show you what it is, and I will explain better what is meant by a problem looking for a solution. This was a truly interdisciplinary project because it brought together people from uh, biomedical engineering, people from pharmacology, toxicology, people from nuclear medicine, particle physicists. So the problem was the following. I, I happened to talk to this colleague here, Professor Weber from the University of Zurich, who is doing uh, these uh, biomedical studies with small animals. For example, he would like to study cerebral blood flow and the underlying mechanism. So how is oxygen perfusing in the brain at which rate and, and so which areas and so on. And he would like to have dynamic PET imaging. He would like basically to get a movie how the tracer distributes in, in the brain. And he would like to do it simultaneously with the MR acquisition because MR, magnetic resonance imaging, gives you uh, morphological information. So this is what he wanted to do. And they had already this MR scanner, which you can see here. This, has this, this is the bore where we wanted them to fit in the, the PET scanner. But he could not buy the PET scanner that he needed. So we started to think, as you see here, because we, the, the, the goal was to produce, uh, to have a PET scanner that could take images every five seconds. In order to take images every five seconds, you have to inject into your animal doses of 500 megabacter well, while typically you inject maybe 50 megabacter well or less. If you have such a high dose, you get many photons. And if you get many photons, you get quickly enough statistics per voxel that you can make an image, right? But 
the PET scanner has to absorb such a high rate, and there was nothing to be, to be bought. So we decided to build it ourselves. And why is this interesting, or why is it interesting to look at small uh, time scales? This is an example of such uh, 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 time activity curves. This is an example where a, 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 a tracer was injected, and you can see the, the tracer concentration in blood and in a, a specific location in the brain. This was not done with PET, it's another technique. And you see how it is taking up in the brain somewhere. And the time scale here is relevant. This is basically a minute. So in order to resolve this take up and to fit some kinetic models that they want to fit, you have to basically take images at the second level and not at the minutes level. So that's why we needed this uh, scanner that can absorb rates up to 500 megabacteria. So the challenges that we had to face, so build a scanner that is sensitive and that can absorb such high rates. Meaning, we had to go to single crystal readout, small crystals, meaning that we had to build a scanner with many, many, many channels, not too far away from the channel numbers that we had in our big experiments. Then, having many channels and the fast detector, because it has to be fast, means power consumption. So how to cool it, how to bring in the power, how to bring it out then everything has to stay within this small bore of the MR scanner. So there's not much space, actually. And you still need some space left for the animal. <laughs> and uh, it should not interfere with the MR. And the MR should not interfere with the, with the PET scanner. So quite a number of daunting uh, challenges. So we designed a scanner. So this is how it looks like. Basically, you have an, a, a sensitive area. This is uh, just crystal rings, right? Now here the crystals are not 20 centimeter long, like in CMS, but uh, 12 millimeter long. Uh, and what we did is basically we made a highly integrated electronic system. The data are immediately digitized. They are immediately packed into Ethernet frames, uh, sent out via gigabit optical fibers, very similar to our high energy detectors, just scaled down in, in size, but lots of techniques that we can just transport there. In the end, this will be a detector with 15,000 channels. This is, as I said, not too far from what we have at high, in certain high energy experiments. Also, like we do in high energy, we started with a prototype to see if we are able to, to understand every component. So instead of having the full uh, crystal number, we started with a smaller number, 3,000. So just two rings of crystal. But this is enough to image, for example, the brain or the, the, the heart region of a mouse or a rat. And uh, this is just the look of the detector as it was constructed. Basically, you just see many sectors. Each sector here contains all the uh, crystal block and the electronics. It's it is within a uh, carbon fiber structure plus some captain cable and copper uh, protection in order to avoid the interaction with the MR cooling and so on. Now, I just wanted to highlight this technically detailed here, again, because it brings a lot of aspects from high energy physics. We designed all the electronics, so the crystal blocks together with the readout ASICs, they can be simply mounted here. There are FB, there's an FPGA, as I said, it, it packs the data and sends it out via uh, gigabit optical fibers. One interesting aspect is this thing here, the down, step down converters. Very often in high energy physics, but also here we have the following problems. The electronics, these FPGAs, the readout chips that work here, they work at uh, low voltages, a few volt. On the other hand, they are, f they are fast electronics, so that it needs power. So how do you get power? By bringing in large current. But if you have many channels you, and you want to bring in large current, you need lots of cables, and you have, you have so much space. So you cannot bring in all thousands of cables. So what do you do? You start outside with high voltage in your power supply, and you go in with low current, so you, you need smaller, you can work with smaller cables, and inside you just transform the voltage from high to low. And how do you transform a voltage? By a transformer, what is a transformer? It's a coil, right? So if you now tell somebody, I'm going to put an air coil into an MR scanner, they would tell you you're crazy. But we, are, we were crazy enough to do it nevertheless, because we do similar things in CMS. We were able to build such uh, converters and to shield them such that they do not interfere with the rest. And here you see, just see a picture of uh, such a, 
such one module, the crystals here, all the electronics there. And last year, we were able to produce the first results with the prototype. We achieved a very, very good time resolution, better than 200 picoseconds at system level, not just two crystal blocks, one point source, but at full system level. And to my knowledge, this is a world record in this type of scanning. We achieved the spatial resolution that we predicted, that we simulated, a bit better than two millimeter. We showed, we were able to show that there is no interference with the MR scanner in both directions. And we started to do first imaging and uh, including high rates. I'll show you some pictures. This is the first example. What you see here are images from two types of scanners. One is a commercial one. It's a com combination of PET and CT, not MR. And the other one is the combination of PET and MR indeed. And you see in the first line is the morphological image, either the MR image or the CT image. This is the head of a dead rat. Here you see the PET image. You, know, you see that actually PET gives you, in certain cases, gives you <coughs> different information than you would expect. And this is just a fusion of the two images taken at the same time. Now, which one is our prototype that basically we put in and basically it, it worked out of the box? And which one is the commercial one? You cannot really tell here. Now, the left one is our uh, prototype and, and, and right is the commercial one. So, first of all, we very quickly we saw the scanner is doing what it, it, it should do. Then we went to high rates. So we injected, for example, close to 100 megabacquerel with a tracer that is used for studying cardiac uh, questions. And um, we took an image for five seconds only. Now, a normal scanner would already not be able to handle about 100 megabacquerel. Our scanner gave this image, and when we showed it to our uh, biolo biology friends, they were immediately super excited because one can see very nicely this special structure here in the, in the heart. And we've ob obtained what we always were dreaming of, namely to produce a video of uh, a, a movie of uh, PET images. We took data over 10 minutes and sampled them in five second, 10 second, 20 second time frame. The, the trace is injected in the tail and then it accumulates in the, in the heart. But actually the people do is take this region of interest and just count but how much tracer is there at a certain moment in time. Now, uh, if you would take a normal scanner and do it at low rates, you would get something like this. With our scanner, you get this data here. And if you zoom in in the first minute, this is what we can measure now. This is what you would be able to measure with a conventional one. Now, with such a data set, you can do kinetic modeling. But with such a data set, you can't. So here we have a, an example of instrumentation now that will allow our biomedical friends to do really new types of measurements. And while we worked on this project, another idea came up. And this idea also led to the founding of a spin-off company. That's why I have to go to corporate design. Uh, this is now about a medical application, a, a clinical application. And the problem is the following. We know that uh, Alzheimer's disease is uh, one of uh, a class of neurodegenerative diseases. It actually is the most common type of disease in the, in the large class of dementia. And as you know, Alzheimer's disease is a huge uh, uh, sociological, medical problem and a financial issue. It's a huge problem. How can you detect Alzheimer? There are several methods. There are biomarkers. There are, of course, psychological tests by looking for cognitive impairment. There is brain imaging by taking MR images and looking of, at volume changes of actually uh, um, of the brain. But the gold standard is PET because there are PET tracers that, that are able to couple to so-called amyloid beta protein. These are protein clusters that accumulate in the brain very much and these protein clusters that accumulate in the brain are thought, very much believed, to be somehow related to the later appearance of the neurodegenerative, uh, of the neurodegeneration. The details really are not completely understood, but one sees that if there is a heavy accumulation of these proteins, there are different types, there is a, a good probability that later on neurodegeneration happens. And with PET, you can very clearly visualize this. 
the other aspect is that uh, so far there is no drug against Alzheimer's. And once the neurons are destroyed, they are irrecoverably destroyed. So what you have to do is somehow avoid that the, the disease appears. So you should be able to, uh, for example, to eliminate this accumulation of these protein clusters. There are many studies for drugs going on at the moment. There are 31 drugs in, in so-called phase three studies. And there's one drug which by chance was de also developed in Zurich. It's called aducanumab that was then licensed to Biogen. It's a huge uh, pharma company. And Biogen only a few months ago announced that they will now go for FDA approval for this drug. It is very likely that very soon we will have the first drug against um, Alzheimer, basically a drug that will help to reduce this uh, accumulation of these protein clusters. Now, if this is realized, then the following thing happens. If you can detect, let's say, five to ten years before the, the disease would develop that you have these uh, proteins and you have a drug to reduce them, you avoid the disease to appear. So it will be more and more important to identify those people that are plug positive. So PET scanning will become more and more important. Ultimately, our vision is that we would like to do large-scale population screening, like you do for other types of early screening for other types of diseases, right? Another application would be just to, if you have a treatment, that you can follow up the treatment. The problem is the following. The scanners that are available in the hospital today are these huge, very expensive, multi-million dollar um, objects that, that, that are room filling. So the throughput in terms of patients is very small. So the idea was the following. Take an amyloid PET scan today. In Switzerland, it costs three to 4,000 Swiss francs. And the price is a combination of the device, the combination of the price for the radio tracer and personnel. And the idea was, are we able to reduce this cost by a factor of 10, by reducing the cost of the device, by a more efficient use of the tracer, and then also a more efficient use of the personnel? And the idea was, instead of having a full body scanner, let's just produce a small uh, scanner for the brain only, put 10 of them, let's say, in the same room, so that we can simultaneously scan many of them using the tracer, for 10 of them, and uh, that the personnel can, can basically uh, uh, supervise many more people at the same time. So this would give us much more throughput. And taking basically all the experience that we gained from the previous project, we started to construct such a brain scanner, a very modular one, and easy to set up. Actually, we can set up our scan in a, in a few hours, where uh, it takes days or weeks to set up a big scanner. And we think we, can, we could sell it maybe for 10 times less, or we could rent it. Actually, that's another idea. And uh, the scanner exists by now. At least the prototype exists. Uh, it shows the performance that we simulated again. Now, in this next month, we, we will start the first clinical studies. And uh, we also have other applications in mind besides the diagnosing of dementia. We, have, we just got the grant for studying other applications. For example, scanning people that are in the intensive care unit. Often the doctors would like to do a PET scan of the brain of people in intensive care unit, but you cannot bring those people to the PET scanner. So the idea is bring the PET scanner to the patient. You cannot do it with a big scanner, but with our scanner that is very versatile, easy, to transport, it should be possible. And another application is <coughs> in the monitoring for proton therapy. <coughs> the, sh the voice shows that I should stop. So, sorry, so just some lessons learned. There's a few lessons learned about these applications where they're following. It's really great fun to work on a completely different field that you worked on for the last decades especially to work with people from completely different fields. You learn a lot, but there's a big but. You have to have a lot of patience and stamina because any, when you enter as a newcomer in a completely new field, it's tough, as you probably know. On the other hand, being at an institution like ETH Zurich, where we have good base funding, helps a lot. So I could overcome tough periods. The important message is it is really crucial to have first a problem or a customer, somebody who really has a problem to be solved. 
instead of just doing R&D. Very often, in particle physics, maybe not a field, people have nice ideas, develop little things, but they have a solution, and then they look for a problem. Obviously, the other way around is much better. Final conclusion, overall conclusion. I found this picture recently, and I thought it shows nicely where we actually are in particle physics. Now back to particle physics, maybe. There are big discussions. Should the next machine be circular or linear? Should we continue along a similar path and go, as, as Maria said, into the desert, not knowing what is going to happen there? Should we take a completely new direction? Maybe I, I just go completely to biomedical engineering and forget about particle physics. So at the moment, at least in Europe, for the European strategy discussion, we are turning around here, and I hopefully soon we will decide which way to go. So thank you very much for your attention, attention, and <laughs>
Now, now what I actually I don't know if uh, what we would study with a 100 TV collider, for example, to a few percent precision, the, 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 the potential of the Higgs boson, I would not know right now how I would do it with an astrophysics experiment. I would not know. Now, in astrophysics, for example, if you look at cosmic ray experiments, you measure multi, multi TV particles, but you measure a handful and not thousands or, or, or more. So there are limitations. I, again, I, I would not know right now how we would do certain things that we uh, would be able to do with a, a 100 TV collider. On the other hand, for example, I think one of the holy grails is, for example, looking for primordial gravitational waves that then could tell us maybe something about inflation that maybe tells us about something, a scale of field and so on. But there is a link. So maybe in that, with this kind of experiments, which I really find super exciting, I see a connection there. But it's not one-to-one, -one, not so direct. 